Hi, this is Michael Altos. We are continuing our discussion of pulmonary physiology, and this is recording part six. Now we're going to speak about some specific respiratory diseases, and the first is asthma. Asthma is an obstructive lung disease, but it's episodic. Patients have episodes of spastic contraction of the smooth muscles that line the bronchioles, and we call that bronchospasm. And these episodes can last anywhere from minutes to hours. And when it happens, it obstructs air movement, especially during expiration. So we expect that they may have a relatively normal FVC, but their FEV1 will be very reduced, and therefore their peak flows will be low. Status asthmaticus is a specific life-threatening bronchospasm that persists even after treatment, and it can be a medical emergency. It can kill people. Triggers for asthma are usually some sort of hypersensitivity to foreign substances like pollen or irritants. Um, there are IgE antibodies which lead to release of histamine from mast cells or some other vasoactive substances. But lots of other triggers exist like cold or infection or exercise or even emotional stress. Our first treatments for asthma would be inhaled bronchodilators and anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, and we can give drugs systemically as well when needed. And we'll discuss these drugs in more detail in the pharmacology curriculum. When we take care of an asthmatic patient, the first thing we want to know is, is their asthma well controlled with their current medication regimen? Or is this patient using their rescue inhaler several times a day, which is really not well controlled? Do they have any signs of respiratory distress? Are they wheezing on auscultation? Um, do they look like they're working hard to breathe? Maybe we should treat them with their bronchodilators before the anesthesia if needed. Some people would consider avoiding intubation when possible in order to minimize stimulating their airway by putting a plastic tube down their trachea. And an LMA may be less stimulating to their airway uh, in surgeries where it's appropriate. When we anesthetize these patients, we really want to get them deep enough to depress their hyperactive airway reflexes. So it turns out you can anesthetize the airway if the patient is anesthetized sufficiently and make it less likely to go into bronchospasm. Some people use IV or endotracheal lidocaine one to three minutes before intubation to try to minimize the bronchospastic response to intubation. Induction drugs that minimize bronchospasm. Well, the best is ketamine. Ketamine is actually a bronchodilator. After that, propofol is pretty good. And thiopental has a reputation for being a little bit of a bronchoconstrictor in very severe patients. All volatile anesthetics are bronchodilators. This needs to be emphasized. Now, the pungency of isoflurane and desflurane can lead patients to cough or have bronchospasm, but that would only be at light planes of anesthesia, like induction or emergence. But if you're using those drugs and the patient goes into bronchospasm, the best thing to do would be to turn them up and get that patient deeply anesthetized to try to break the bronchospasm. Let's be very clear, neuromuscular blocking drugs have no effect on bronchospasm because bronchospasm involves smooth muscle and neuromuscular blocking drugs only affect skeletal muscle. Patients who have asthma have obstructive lung disease and so therefore we need to leave enough time for exhalation. On capnography, we'll see that obstructive, upslanting um, pattern. And so we need to make sure their I to E ratio and their respiratory rate can accommodate enough time for exhalation. And in certain patients, when it's appropriate, you may consider a deep extubation. So they don't wake up with a tube in their throat and maybe trigger bronchospasm. This is something to consider in the appropriate patients. So that's asthma. The next disease, somewhat related, is called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. COPD presents as a classic triad of chronic bronchitis, asthma, and emphysema. So these patients will have bronchospasm. They'll have obstruction due to excessive pulmonary secretions. Their lungs lose their elasticity or their recoil, which normally keeps the airways open. And their bronchiolar wall becomes less rigid. And all of this leads to airway collapse during exhalation. And the faster they blow out, 
so as their airways collapse, the bronchioles become narrow. The bronchioles become narrow, and that increases gas velocity through the bronchioles. And what does that cause? A venturi effect, which further pulls the airways shut to collapse. These patients have destruction of their lung tissue. The air sacs start to enlarge, and they develop emphysema. Emphysema is overstretching of their alveoli. If you think about a rubber balloon that's been inflated and deflated many, many times, and it becomes kind of saggy and floppy, that's emphysema. So patients with emphysema have chronic obstruction of their smaller airways. Air becomes entrapped in those alveoli, and it causes them to be overstretched and floppy. As the alveoli become destroyed, we start to lose their ability to diffuse gas across the membrane, and they have impaired diffusion capacity. These patients may have different kinds of disease in different parts of their lungs. So some parts of their lungs could have shunt due to obstruction of airways, so they don't ventilate, but they're perfusing. Other parts of their lungs may have dead space. And finally, they develop increased resistance to pulmonary blood flow due to the disease in the lung, and this causes pulmonary hypertension and right heart failure. What leads to COPD? Well, the biggest risk factor by far is smoking. But there are others, including patients who have chronic respiratory infections and occupational exposures to dust or mining or textiles. The signs and symptoms of COPD include a chronic productive cough, wheezing, exercise limitation, once again, we expect an expiratory airflow obstruction, so a decrease in FEV1. And because of their chronic hypoxia, they start to develop an increase in hemoglobin. They develop an erythrocytosis, so their hematocrit will be very high. These patients are treated with oxygen supplementation, if, the, if necessary, because we want to keep their PO2 at least at 60 to 80. This helps prevent pulmonary hypertension and helps deliver adequate oxygen to their tissues. And otherwise, we usually treat them with some combinations of bronchodilators and steroids, either inhaled or even systemic steroids when needed. The anesthetic approach to patients with COPD is similar to asthma in many ways. In addition to the things we described for asthma, we may want to consider pulmonary function testing, but not every patient who has COPD needs pulmonary function testing because it doesn't really predict your perioperative risk. The patients who probably should get pulmonary function testing would be patients who are so hypoxic on room air that they need home oxygen therapy, patients who have a very high bicarbonate, and if you think about it, patients or if their PCO2 is greater than 50. So these are patients who are retaining a lot of CO2, maybe because their lungs are so diseased they can't diffuse CO2 out. And because the CO2 is building up, they're starting to build up bicarbonate in order to buffer that CO2. Patients who've gone into respiratory failure before and they've needed to be on some mechanical support. Patients who have severe dyspnea and walk around chronically short of breath. A patient who's going to have a pneumonectomy. You can imagine a copd -er who's going to have one of their lungs removed is at great risk for uh, maybe never coming off the ventilator. If we're not really clear why they have lung disease, if we're trying to determine their response to bronchodilators to know if they'll be helpful in the post-operative management, and patients who we think may have gone into pulmonary hypertension, these sick patients may benefit from pulmonary function testing. Patients with COPD, as we said before, can undergo air trapping, which means that as they're expiring the air, as they're exhaling, their lungs close, their airways uh, obstruct, and air becomes trapped inside the lungs, and they can't get it out before the next breath begins. So then their next breath adds air to what's already trapped in the lungs, and this leads to breath stacking and increased intrathoracic pressures, which decreases your venous return and increases pulmonary hypertension and puts strain on the right ventricle. Again, capnography in patients with obstructive disease shows this up-sloping CO2 uh, waveform, and you'll see it's still up-sloping at the start of the next breath. 
not only air can be trapped, but volatile anesthetic can be trapped. And so theoretically, we could have delayed emergence because they can't breathe out the air that contains their volatile anesthetic. Patients with COPD are at increased risk for postoperative respiratory depression and hypercarbia after receiving opioids. And so opioids should be used very carefully in these patients. And postoperatively, as you can imagine, they are at increased risk for respiratory failure and the need for mechanical ventilation. And especially if they have severe obstructive disease, so an FEV1 to FVC ratio of less than 0.5, or if their preoperative PCO2 on an ABG is greater than 50 millimeters of mercury. When we talk about COPD, often these patients are classified into two general classifications, the pink puffers and the blue bloaters. So the blue bloaters are also called CO2 retainers. In these patients, their main manifestation of COPD is chronic bronchitis with all of its mucus production and inflammation this leads to VQ mismatch, increased cardiac output, decreased ventilation. The patients present with hypoxia, hypercapnia, and acidosis. On exam, we expect to find wheezing, sometimes ronchi. And these patients develop core pulmonale, which is right ventricular failure. This can lead to volume overload. And the hypoxia can lead to polycythemia, an increased red blood cell count. Now, if you give these patients supplemental oxygen, what we see on their blood gas is that they hypoventilate and their PCO2 goes up. Now, a little background. We know that in healthy patients, the primary respiratory drive is the hypercapnic drive. When your PCO2 goes up even a little bit, you increase your ventilation. And the hypoxic drive is really secondary. In these patients with COPD and chronic hypercapnia, the body sort of gets used to this increased CO2. Their hypercapnic drive becomes blunted. And now their hypoxic respiratory drive, instead of their hypercapnic drive, becomes the primary uh, stimulus to breathe. So some people think that that's how we explain giving supplemental oxygen causes hypoventilation and increased PCO2. They think that giving supplemental oxygen leads to some kind of apnea because since they have a blunted hypercapnic drive and now the supplemental oxygen has turned off their hypoxic drive, they'll stop breathing and become hypercarbic. This is not correct. And let's understand what's actually happening with our CO2 retaining patients. There are two main mechanisms that are thought to be at work here. First of all, there is VQ mismatch. Patients with COPD use hypoxic vasoconstriction in order to optimize blood flow to the healthiest regions of their lung and shunt blood away from the diseased areas. When you administer excessive supplemental oxygen, you undo the hypoxic vasoconstriction and you increase blood flow to the poorly ventilated areas. This is actually an increase in dead space. And this effect is more pronounced in the CO2 retainers. In addition, let's remember the Haldane effect, which says that deoxygenated hemoglobin can bind to CO2 better than oxyhemoglobin. When you give excessive oxygen, you shift the carboxyhemoglobin curve to the right, and this releases the carbon dioxide from the hemoglobin and increases arterial PCO2. So it's not that these patients have become apneic. There are physiologic processes that are occurring that increase their PCO2. But the real question is, is it safe to give these patients oxygen or not? The simple answer is yes. We should give oxygen to patients who need it but we shouldn't give them more than they need because we can see a dangerous elevation in PCO2 with high amounts of supplemental oxygen. Give them the oxygen they need, monitor them, check a PO2 to make sure it's in a safe area. These patients may be acceptably 
uh, treated with a SAT of 90 to 92 percent. Don't shoot for 98 percent, that may be unachievable, and that's when we start seeing dangerously high PCO2s. Now, other patients who have COPD are not CO2 retainers. These are called the pink puffers. These patients, main pathology is emphysema, the destruction of the lung parenchyma. They have less surface area and vascular bed for gas exchange. So they can't oxygenate their blood very well. They are hyperventilating and they have decreased cardiac output. They don't have as much of an issue with VQ mismatch as the blue bloaters. These patients on exam will have a mild cough, diminished breath sounds from their hyperinflated lungs, and the low cardiac output tends to make them thin with muscle wasting, and they have tissue hypoxia. That's it for this section. As always, please let me know if you have any questions.